So, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28 is on the heels of um, God commanding that his people go up and stand on uh, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim in order to signify the blessings and the curses that were associated with choosing to get into a covenant with the Lord. So God, as we talked about last week and the week previous, and God's people have made an agreement or they have a, a vouched, they've, a, they've assured one another, they've answered one another, they've affirmed that they're going to keep their covenant. And we know that in the end it was God only that kept the covenant. But as people certainly set their hearts to do so, and I think as Christians, that's what we have to do each and every day. Set our hearts to serve God, knowing that without His strength we're going to fall short, of course. Go back to Him in repentance and ask for Him to forgive you. Um, without His strength we're never going to succeed, and that's why Joshua, like we talked about last week, said, will you choose this day whom you will serve? And the people said, we'll serve the Lord. And he's like, you can't serve the Lord. Why? Because of that exact truth there. We don't have it in us. Flesh and blood cannot obey God's commands in their fullness. That's, that's the bottom line of men. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're not getting away from that. Now, <clears throat> they didn't do it. They actually broke up the, the, the tribes evenly. We have, if you look in Deuteronomy 27 and verse 12, it says, These shall stand upon Mount Gerizim to bless the people when ye are come over Jordan. Simeon, Levi, and Judah, and Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. There's six tribes there. Verse 13 continues and said, And these shall stand upon Mount Ebal to curse Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. So there's an even six and six on each side of the, uh, or on each mount, respectively. Now, what we'll find actually, as we read through Deuteronomy chapter 28 and try to glean some truths from it, we'll find that the amount of curses, and if you were to follow through and count, we have verse 15, cursed be the man in chapter 27, uh, verse 16, cursed be he, and so on. We have there listed 12 curses that were to be applied to the people of Israel if they did not do according to the Lord's voice. Then we begin to hear from God the blessings in chapter 28, as well as more curses. And we're going to find there's certainly many more curses associated with disobeying God than the blessings that come from obeying God. Now, that doesn't mean that, that it's necessarily God is, is more firm on the punishment side than he is on the blessing and encouraging and strengthening his people's side as far as how he deals with things. But... I think that just gives the assurance that the magnitude of God's blessing is so much more that when you're on His side, even one simple blessing from the Lord counts for and covers up the two or three different curses that could be associated with not following after Him. Um, it also, I guess, gives us a little bit of a picture of, of the Bible as a whole. Because if you read the Bible, and you even go to an uh, example in Jeremiah, where Jeremiah was uh, told by God to root down, break down, pluck up, and then eventually it was plant and water. You'll find that one-third of Jeremiah's ministry was a positive message, and two-thirds of his ministry was negative. And that's actually what you find here. Two-thirds of God's ministry to the people is cursing for disobedience, and one-third of his ministry or preaching to us is highlighting the blessings that you receive as a result of following him. So that's just an interesting thing to note. So let's get into Deuteronomy chapter 28 in the context of what we're talking about. The commands to go and stand on these two mounts. And God kind of giving the last um, signifying of the blessings for obedience to his people. Chapter 28 and verse 1 it says, And it shall come to pass if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments that the Lord or which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. And I love that phrase there. It says, all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. And that, that phrase, overtake thee, if you're to look in uh, uh, different passages early in Deuteronomy and some other places, just look up that term, overtake. It has the idea that essentially 
the people aren't even seeking after the blessings, but rather these blessings come upon them and, and overtake them. They almost attack them. The blessings just bear down on you, catch up with you, and they get you whether you like it or not. That, that's how, how firm and, and intent, that's the intent of God is that when you obey, he gets after you to bless you. He seeks after you actively and diligently to make sure that you're blessed. He overtakes you if you shall hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. And so there's a little affirmation. God's not slack towards blessing you. When you obey, you may not receive blessings for a while. It may seem like actually your life has gotten harder as you get more, um, as you get more desirous and, and more attentive to his word and try to obey his word and follow his commandments. You may find that your life isn't getting so great, but God is diligent and prepared and looking after overtaking you with his blessings as a result. So just because they're not there today, well, God's just catching up to you to bless you in the end. So you have something to look forward to. And he says that his nation of Israel will be set on high above all the nations of the earth. And he's going to begin to list the blessings. Verse 3, Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. And we need both, certainly, don't we? Cities are bustling plays, lots of people here, lots of movement, lots of action, um, things going on. And the, the city can be actually a rather cursed place if it was not for a God richly blessing it in this way. And blessed shalt thou be in the field indicates that you'll be able to bring in food that will actually sustain the city. Farmers feed cities is, the, is that phrase you hear all the time. And that's true. And God here says that if we're obedient to him, then the cities shouldn't be such a cursed place to live. I mean, when I was first, I believe, called to come down and serve here, my wife and I laughed at one another because we were just talking about how much of a curse it would be to go and have to serve in Toronto or someplace like that. We, that wasn't what we envisioned. We wanted to go and be in a country house, in a, in a, in a field somewhere with a, with a small church out there. And we just, it was abhorrent to us to go into a city. Why? Because the city has become a cursed place. There's not much blessing going on in downtown Toronto as a whole. It's a, it's a rough place. It's a dirty place. It's a place that, that is not overexcitable to, to live in unless, you know, when we were younger and we were, we were into that activity and that action. But we got a taste of the country life, and that was what we envisioned. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't for the call of God in my life is what I'm saying. But if we were as a city and as a nation and as, a, as, a, as a individuals, Hearkening under the voice of God, then there's no reason why the city of Toronto shouldn't be blessed. So what do we need? We need more people in Toronto to love the Lord thy God with all their heart. We need more people to follow after and to seek after his commandments so the city can be blessed. And also the field can be blessed and the nation as a whole can be lift up above all the nations of the earth. That would be a wonderful thing to happen. Verse 4, it says, Blessed shall the, the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind, the flocks of thy sheep. So obeying the voice of the Lord God actually allows us to keep the original commandment that he gave to Adam as well as um, the, the animals at that time in Genesis 1 and 2. And what he promised would, would happen as a result of their diligence. Blessings in fruitfulness growth and, and offspring coming and, and, and more people being born into this earth, more animals being born into this earth, and a great increase as a result of being obedient to God. That's a wonderful blessing. Verse 5, Blessed shalt thou be in thy basket and in thy store, never being without, having stuff to carry away that will provide your need, and being able to go and pick up from the store or from your store all the things that you would require. Basically having enough and plenty over so that you know that your future is taken care of because you are blessed in the basket and in the store. But that comes again from obedience to God. Verse 6, Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. Travel. Great blessings as a result of obeying. God would allow for you to come and to go and to move about and to visit with people and to rejoice. We're not blessed in that area right now. And do you know why? Because we are not obedient to the Lord God. I was just talking about going and visiting Leamington. And we always have to talk to one another and figure out, well, is it a hot zone? You guys yourselves try to travel somewhere and it's been deemed unsafe because the neighbors are all going to tell on you for, for getting together with people. You always have to ask these questions now because our nation is not blessed in coming in and going out. We can't even leave our nation without having to do some sort of weird restrictions, get some strange tests, get, you know, get some sort of uh, identification that proves you haven't been to this place or that place or, or whatever. You need to have, you're, you're not blessed as a result of our disobedience and therefore you cannot come in and go out freely. 
Verse 7 continues, The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face, and shall come out against thee one way, and shall flee before thee seven ways. So, obedience to God would allow that we have safety. And not only safety, we have um, God actually going before us and smiting our enemies bef before us. They come against us as one man, and God promises that they'll flee several ways. Seven ways, he, here he says specifically. And that's a wonderful blessing as well, too. you got to think that when enemies come upon you, if they flee seven ways, it's because God really took care of them, didn't he? He, he hit them so hard that they didn't know what was happening. And they, did, they came united, and they left divided, scattered, and didn't know what to do with themselves. And there is a good blessing, especially for a nation, to leave your enemies scattered and confused and confounded. And that comes if the nation is following after God. Verse 8, The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses, and in all that thou settest thine hand unto. And he will bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee and holy people unto himself, as he hath sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. And all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. So God here, I don't think is commanding perfection for the individual, but as a whole, as a multitude, there needs to be an established righteousness among them. And when we look around our nation, we basically have the opposite. We have an established unrighteousness. When you look around the nation, you don't see a godly, conservative, righteous, God-fearing people. You see the exact opposite, where the norm is to be shacking up. The norm is to drink alcohol, smoke cigarettes, do whatever. The norm is all sorts of unrighteous deeds, but God here says that if you certainly seek after him and keep his commandments and follow after him in general as a people and you are called by the name of the lord and that's been a it's been a long time since you could say of canada that that this is a christian nation we stand on on guard for thee and god keep our land we kind of throw god a bone in our national anthem we're far removed from those days and you can see it, and you can tell it, and we would not be a people known by the name of the Lord. We'd be an atheistic type nation. We would be an anything goes melting pot, as they call it, where, where you can be any type of religion and we'll accept you. But by and large, they do not accept the Bible-believing Christian. That's abnormal. That's strange and foreign unto our nation, and it certainly shows. Verse 11, And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods. What a blessing that would be. In the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and the fruit of thy ground, in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee. Now as we read through this, of course, we're grasping that the context here is Israel according to the flesh, back in the time after the Exodus, right before they stepped into the promised land. What I like to do is, yes, look at that immediate context that was talking to those people, but now apply it to us. Weren't we a nation that has been plenteous and good in the past? Those days may be over, but we have been. We've been rich when you compare us with the majority of nations in this world. Fruit of the cattle, fruit of the body, fruit of the ground, the land rich with nourishment and with, with, with the ability to bring forth fruits unto us so that we are sustained. I've said it a long time that Canada could cut off trade and we could take care of ourselves. We are richly blessed here as a nation, and yet we've been removed from that. We're turning away, we're lifting ourselves up with pride, and as a result we are seeking after destruction. Verse 12, it says, The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto thy land in his season, and to bless all the work of thine hands, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. I think the norm now is everybody borrows, isn't it? This world is falling into debt and into that trap. Verse 13, And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. Right, The head leads and, and, and follows the charge. The head's where all the thinking happens. The tail just simply goes where the head desires. When you're the tail, you're being led about, tossed about. You have nothing to guide you except for who is leading. And thou shalt not be beneath, if that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. 
Verse 14, And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day, to the right hand or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them, but it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Now we just saw a list of 12 different curses, and here we are getting a few blessings listed for us, six in general, where it says blessed, 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 and the other items that were listed. And now God's going to highlight the curses back unto us. Now, again, God's not imbalanced. It's not like he just loves to curse people and, and, and he's, he's slack concerning blessing people. But I think he also knows our frame. And our frame is this. We react better to consequences, don't we? <laughs> right? When, when, when we talk to our children and we say, you know, punishment's going to come, they straighten up and fly right a lot faster than we, if we say, we'll give you candy if you do good. You know, like, kids just have this idea, well, I always get candy, so, so that's fine. I'm always going to be blessed by my father and my mother because, because they love me. And we get that idea with God. God's always going to bless me and care for me and take care of me. And so, yeah, 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 I should keep his commandments, but God's really going to bless me anyway. So he knows our frame and he knows that that's the way we think. And so he's got to highlight the punishments that come from disobedience. And he's got to really highlight and put the pressure on us by reminding us of what happens when we break his rules. And that's, that's in us. I mean, God figured that out quickly the moment Adam and Eve had fallen into sin, that that's how we're going to respond. And that's how he actually implemented um, his righteous judgment upon us. He didn't say to Adam, well, you know, you ate that seed, but, or you ate that fruit and obeyed your wife, and the wife heeded to the serpent, completely turning the authority structure upside down. But, you know what, I'll give you more fruit, and I'll give you better fruit and better blessings if you just don't do that again. No, that's not how it worked. God said, all right, here's the curses. Cursed in childbearing. Adam, sweat of the brow. That's how you're going to go get your meat from now on. Snake, eat dust. And that's how God doled out punishment in order to get people to walk straight. We need that. I need that. That's how I respond best is knowing the, the fear of the God in me pushes me to do right because I know God's going to bless me, certainly, but I also have to have a healthy fear and understand that, hey, if I walk against his commandments and do not follow after him. I will be cursed in everything that I do. And this is what he begins to highlight. Verse 15, it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee. And there's that same word, and overtake thee. So just as the blessings, you know, come at you, like, like, a, like, a, like a cheater gets on a gazelle. Right when we think about doing right, and, and it bears down on the gazelle, and there's a blessing for you. In the same way, God will overtake you with curses when you least expect it, and perhaps when you're trying to get away, if you do not obey him. He's not slack with that. Verse 16, Cursed shall thou be in the city, cursed shalt thou be in the field, cursed shall be thy basket and thy store, cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land and the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, rebuke, and all that thou settest thine hand unto for to do, until thou be destroyed, and until thou perish quickly, because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me, the Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee until he have consumed thee from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. And so basically every blessing that he could give, he'll just turn it on its head. You'll be blessed in these things, but if you disobey, you'll be cursed in those same areas. He says here that the, the cursing and the vexation will be such that you'll be destroyed as a result of it. And unfortunately, what I see here actually is a better picture of our nation outside those doors than the opposite. We are perishing quickly, set to be destroyed as a result of the wickedness of our doings, forsaking the Lord, turning far from Him. And as a result, here we have pestilence. Here we have consumption and here is a promise to Israel nullified as a result of their disobedience you have that in verse 21 people always like to talk about Israel as having this everlasting eternal promise of that slab of land over there in Israel but the result is as you read through Deuteronomy and I've been accumulating a list as I go through it 
it was conditional. And here again, he says, if you disobey, you will be consumed from off the land. That doesn't give me an indication of an everlasting eternal promise. Those that went in in 1948, filled that land, did so not under the authority and blessing of God Almighty. They did it under the authority and blessing of the Rockefellers, the rich of this world, the, 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 throne, of de- the throne of the devil himself. They're there, cursed in that land. Why? Because they are not loving the Lord. They are not seeking after Him. They are not there because God has blessed them. They will always cease to be con- or continue to be consumed out of that land because that promise was conditional upon their obedience and submission and faithfulness to the Word of God. Verse 22, it says, The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption and with a fever and with an inflammation, with an extreme burning and with the sword and with blasting, with mildew, and they shall pursue thee until thou perish. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be as brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. And the Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust, From heaven it shall come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them and shalt be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. And thy carcass shall be meat unto the fowls of the air and unto the beasts of the earth. And no man shall fray them away. The Lord will smite thee with the botch of Egypt and with the emeralds, and with the scab, and with the itch, whereby thou canst not be healed. The Lord shall smite thee with madness, and blindness, and astonishment at heart, and thou shalt grope at noonday, as the blind gropeth in darkness. And thou shalt not prosper in thy ways, and thou shalt be only oppressed, and spoiled evermore, and no man shall save thee. Now there's an evermore promise that God has given to those that say they are Jews but are not. Those that abide in that land, accepting it as if it were a promise unto them from God Almighty. The only promise that they have is eternal, everlasting here, evermore consumption and and ruin and rot and destruction, falling to their enemies, lacking things and and just, just turmoil of heart because they have turned from the Lord God. It's not a good picture here that the Lord paints of what happens to a nation, what happens to a people that disobeys Him, especially if they're God's chosen people. Put yourself here and think. God has given you salvation through His Lord Jesus Christ. Through our Savior, we have access to the Father, the Spirit abiding in us, illuminating these scriptures and highlighting to them to us, bringing them to remembrance, teaching us all things whatsoever we would, we should do that God has taught us to do. And so we have this higher expectation of us because we know better in all these things. We think about if, if we're in a situation of, of mixed children, if I go to a park and one kid is punching and hitting and throwing people around and, and just misbehaving and then my son does it well i come down on my son and i correct him and i stop him and i just let the other kid do it he wants he's not mine he doesn't belong to me i have no authority over him and yeah he's certainly going to be cursed as a result of his misbehaving but that's up to somebody else to deal with but god deals with us as believers and as children and therefore he rebukes chastens and corrects us because he doesn't want us to fall into the cursings that he has promised us when we disobey. Verse 31, it says, Thine ox shall be slain before thine eyes, and thou shalt not eat thereof. Thine ass shall be violently taken away from before thy face, and shall not be restored to thee. Thy sheep shall be given into thine enemies, and thou shalt have none to rescue them. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people. Thine eyes shall look and fail with longings for them all the day long, and there shall be no might in thine hand. The fruit of thy land and all thy labors shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, and thou shalt only be oppressed and crushed alway, so that thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. The Lord shall smite thee in the knees and in the legs, with a sore botch that it cannot be healed, and the sole of thy foot unto the top of thy head, the Lord shall bring thee 
and thy king which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known and there shalt thou serve under God other gods with wood and stone other gods of wood and stone God's been highlighting here the punishment to disobedient believers disobedient people that would be called his children it's physical you you've got you've got the botch on you you've got soreness smitten in the knees and in the legs and and you've got that physical ailment it's also spiritual it talks about here how he's groping at noonday as a, as a blind man does it talks about how how he he's gone mad as a result of not being seen and and blindness that has overcome him thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see vexation so you've got a physical and a spiritual and you've also got a punishment here that goes beyond and transcends generations and affects your sons and your daughters and and your 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 uh, your children after you. It's a very serious thing to fall into the hands of the living God, especially if you're known as His people. The Lord shall bring thee and thy king, which thou shalt set over thee. This is verse 36. Unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, and there shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone. And I think this is a, a foresight of Babylon coming upon his people Israel and overtaking them and bringing them into their lands and teaching them their ways and forcing them to serve after their own gods, wood and stone and the idols that they had set up. That's not a blessing. Could you imagine today we're in Canada and we have liberty to, to serve our God and, and others have liberty to serve their gods. There's, there's, there's by and large religious freedom here. Could you imagine if our whole nation was taken over by like a Muslim nation or a whole nation was taken over by Salt Lake City or something and we were forced to serve their gods, literally rooted up and at gunpoint, forced to serve after Allah, forced to follow after, you know, the Muslim or the Mormon Jesus or something like that. That is a, a, a super deep bless or a super deep cursing, but it's also something that, that affects you so deeply because what you knew before is actually culturally ingrained in you. Could you imagine just having to turn your whole lifestyle upside down and being forced to do so? That's what these people are experiencing. When another king comes, and this is often how God actually, actually enacts his revenge and his rage and his wrath upon a nation, is he will send another nation greater and mightier than his own and the one that he is dealing with to overthrow them and to destroy them and then to pull them away so that he can finally get their attention and they will repent and actually get back to serving God. Why? Because now they see that serving God was the right way to go because they've seen the end result of what happens when they disobey. Again, we need to be punished sometimes before we actually get right with God and do what is right. It's an unfortunate um, truth, but it's a truth nonetheless. Verse 37 continues and says, Thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, a byword among all the nations where the Lord shall lead thee. That's, that's you, you become like a mocking. Oh, don't be like Israel. Oh, no one wants to be like Israel or like those Christians. There's a proverb that comes. Why? Because they disobeyed God and God allowed for their name that previous he promise would be lifted up and exalted and, and put upon high. He allowed their name to be drugged through the mud for the rebellion that they had done unto him. Verse 39, Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but shall neither drink of the wine nor gather of the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. Thou shalt have olive trees throughout all thy coast, but thou shalt not anoint thyself with oil, for thine olive shall cast his fruit. Putting lots of work and labor into your land and getting nothing back as a result. Thou shalt begat sons and daughters, but thou shalt not enjoy them, for they shall go into captivity. They'll become slaves of men. All thy trees and fruit of thy land shalt the locust consume. The stranger that is within thee shalt th get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. Humiliated and humbled before the strangers and before your enemies is the promise to the disobedient. He shall lend unto thee, and thou shalt not lend unto him. He shall be the head, thou shalt be the tail. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee, and shall pursue thee, and overtake thee. 
till thou be destroyed because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. And they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder and upon thy seed forever. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things, therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. Look at that verse there. Contrasting service and servitude. Look, we will all eventually find ourselves in submission to something and to someone. Authority is a big deal in God's holy word. And he talks about who is the boss in certain situations. I talked about how in the Garden of Eden, the whole realm of authority was turned on its head. Serpent told the woman who told the man, and then as a result, sin entered into the world. It ought to have been, man commands the woman who is an authority over the serpent. So when the serpent came to the woman, she would just say, no, 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 my husband says that's not what God said. But our submission as in everything in our lives, comes with a choice to make. And when you look at these two verses in their context and, and just, just grasp what it's really saying here, why would you ever choose to serve enemies? <laughs> Look, God promises when you're in servitude unto Him, there's a joyfulness. There's a gladness of heart. There's abundance of all things. He's providing all that you would need. He doesn't treat you like a slave. He treats you like a friend. And he blesses you and he cares for you. Your family unto him when you choose to serve God. The opposite is that if you choose not to serve God, God will send you someone to serve. And it will not be of your choice. It will be of compulsion. And it will be in hunger that you serve and in thirst that you serve. You'll be a slave in nakedness and for want of all things with a hard yoke upon your neck as you serve. Jesus Christ said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light, is what Christ said. And there's a joyfulness, like I said, with taking on that light yoke of serving Christ. There's a gladness of heart, an abundance of all things provided for you when you work and serve God. So make that choice today. Whom shall you serve? As for me and my house, we all had to say, I will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. That is the decision. That is the right decision. And here you can see, based on the consequences, it's the right decision. Verse 49, it says, The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. He says here in verse 50, A nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of old, nor show favor unto the young. So in your own time, I'm uh, going to abstain from it right now, but you can go to Daniel chapter 8, and you're going to find that same phrase, fierce countenance. Here it's talking about a nation coming upon the people of Israel that will not regard the person of old, nor show favor unto the young. It says, He shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed, which also shalt not leave thee either corn or wine or oil or increase of kind or of flocks or of sheep until he have destroyed thee. And that's talking about the nation that the people Israel, if they're disobedient, will serve under. One of fierce countenance, one that the visage of them, the face of them is fierce and angry and vicious and in its presentation. And these will come and lord over them. Now, this is talking to the context of the people of Israel. Over there in Daniel, it talks about a king of a fierce countenance. And that king in the context looks like it's pointing to a future time in Daniel's day, which may or may not have been when, the, when Rome entered into Israel and destroyed it in 70 AD in Jerusalem. It may have been talking about that, but also some of the language actually indicates that this is even a future king beyond that, which may be the Antichrist that we will one day encounter. And so that's why I say when you read Deuteronomy chapter 28, you can bring this into your own time and your own understanding because we are that cursed nation. You know what? As that cursed nation, a king of fierce countenance will come upon us 
as a result of our disobedience. And when that king comes upon us, verse 52 it says, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates until thy high and fenced walls come down. You know what a besiegement it is? That's when he locks you in, traps you, makes you a prison, a prisoner in your own home and just waits it out until you're destroyed for want. You run out of food. You run out of water. You run out of sanity of mind. You run out of patience. And eventually, those walls come crashing down. We have a Lord over us today in this nation, don't we? It's a, it's a health Lord, right? They're locking us in our homes. They're besieging us, as it were, in our homes. Now, as Christians, we can certainly be free in Christ. And I encourage you to find that freedom in your life. Though you may be heeding some of these stay-at-home orders and doing your best to just hang out there, you have to not become a prisoner to that system because that is what they want for you. Be free in Christ. Be free spiritually by singing to yourself in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Be free in Christ by praying to Him and meditating upon His Word. Be free in Christ by having fellowship with your family, with other believers, best you can get away with at this time. Don't be besieged. Have the yoke of Christ upon you. Again, choose joyfulness. Choose gladness of heart. Choose the abundance of all things that comes from serving God. And that's the best thing that we can do in days like this when the world, as a result of the sins of the nation that is out there, when the world is falling to a king of fierce countenance and falling under the rule of a nation of fierce countenance, this antichrist nation that is coming upon us, this religious system that is coming upon us, we need to be free as best as we can. And that only comes from being free and spiritual in Christ. It says in verse 53, and this just keeps getting worse for those that are besieged. A besiegement is a horrendous way to destroy a nation. Why? They lock you in and then they just wait until you destroy yourself and fall to the, to the solitude that's been forced upon you. It says in verse 52 in the second part, it says, The fenced walls come down, wherein thou trustest. Right? What's the safest place for most people is in their home, in their walls. You've trusted that you are safe there. Throughout all thy land, it says, and he shall besiege thee in thy gates. Throughout all thy land, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. They're literally prisoners in the land that God gave them to flourish in. They're trapped in the land that God gave them to flourish in. They're suffering want in the land that God promised they would flourish in. In verse 53, and it says, And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee, in the siege and in the straightness, wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee. Imagine being in such distress. Something so horrific like that would come upon people. But that's what happened in Israel when they were besieged by Babylon. Such distress. We know of the story in the Old Testament where they were basically talking about this child and what they would do with it. A mom and a mom. Well, we, 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 we partook of your child yesterday and you promised we could partake of your child today for the siege and for the straightness and for the distress that we are under. That's what men and women were reduced to. This is serious business to fall into the curse of God. When, he's, when you've gone so far that God decides to send a nation upon you, upon his people, in order to get them right. It's a fearful thing, again, to fall into the hands of the living God. So that the man that is tender among you and very delicate, his eyes shall be evil towards his brother and toward the wife of his bosom and toward the remnant of his children, which he shall leave. Verse 55. So that he will not give to any of them of the flesh of his children, whom he shall eat, because he hath nothing left him in the siege and in the straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee in all thy gates. The tender and delicate women among you, which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness, her eyes shall be evil. And the evil eye talks about covetousness. And here is the worst type of covetousness. Toward the husband of her bosom and toward the son and toward her daughter and toward her young one that cometh out from between her feet and toward her children, which she shall bear for she shall eat them for want of all things secretly. In the siege and in the straightness wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee in thy gates. And this happened to Israel. What a shame, a sad shame when God promised them literally the opposite. 
blessings and fruitfulness and now their siege and straightness were by the fruit of their womb the fruit of their of their heritage literally becomes the only thing that they would consider provision in their life to sustain themselves for the selfishness that has come upon them in the siege and in the straightness verse 58 bottom line if thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear this and glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God. And this is the problem. If thou choose not to observe God's law, if you choose not to obey His word, if you choose not to put your fear upon Him and His glorious and fearful name, then you're making the decision towards re rejection, destruction, consumption, the worst type of scenario comes when you hit rock bottom of disobeying God, when you are known as His people, when you are known by His name. I'm a Christian, but I'm in obe disobedience. I'm turning from Him and not seeking after His commandments. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Verse 59, Then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful, and thy plagues of thy seed even the great plague, and of a long countenance and sore sickness, and of long continuance. Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt. Go back and read that in Exodus. Which thou wast afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee. Also every sickness and every plague, which is not written in the book of this law. There's even things that aren't even contained in the law of God, that God will bring upon a nation that turns from him. Then will the Lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed, and thou shalt be left few in number, whereas ye were as the stars of heaven for multitude, because thou wouldest not obey the voice of the Lord thy God. And we were just talking about this today when we think about how many people would call themselves Christians even in this city, and yet how many churches remain open, available, fellowshipping one with another. It almost seems like a curse just like this has fallen upon God's people in this day. As you were numbered as the stars of heaven for multitude when you were in obedience, now you'll be left a few because you've rejected the voice of the Lord thy God. And we know any of us who have been around this city for a while and been saved for a while and have been trying to get into a church and trying to fellowship with like-minded believers, we know that by and large, the voice of the Lord thy God was not in the places and the assemblies where people would call themselves believers and say that they are Christians. God's voice was far from them. And so they are destroyed. They are few this day. And they're few even for what he said in verse 61. For a sickness and for a plague which isn't even written in the book. And it shall come to pass, verse 63, that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught. And ye shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from one end of earth even unto the other, and there shalt thou serve under other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease. Neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest, but the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart and a failing of eyes and a sore of mind. I'm thinking even a year ago, how much easier my life was a year ago how much more rest i had for the sole of my feet but today and among the people here there's a trembling heart there's a failing of eyes there's a sorrow of mind being manifested and it all stems from disobedience to god verse 66 thy life shall hang in doubt before thee and thou shalt fear day and night and shalt have none assurance of thy life in the morning thou shalt say, Would God it were even. And at even thou shalt say, Would God it were morning. For the fear of thine heart wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships, by the way whereof I spake unto thee. Thou shalt see it no more again, and there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man should buy you. The end of the believer, the end of the Christian that rebels from the command of God is such that even the world rejects you when you're sold into bondage and slavery unto them. 
This is a serious thing. Obedience. And it begins with obedience and submission in our own lives. Wives to their husbands. Children to their parents. Um, men to, to their bosses in as much as they can in the Lord. We need to be people that are willing to humble ourselves and fall into the authority structures that God has given to us. We need to be people that obey the rules, follow the commands when they align with the scriptures. And this is all that God is asking. God's not asking us here to, to, to follow mandates of men that, that reject the word of God. No, the mandates of men that are falling upon the world are this curse that God is talking about. They refused and rejected him even though he bought and paid for them on the cross 2,000 years ago. Therefore, they will fall into bondage. They will fall into servitude. They will be destroyed by that nation, by that king of fierce countenance when that day comes. But we as believers don't have to suffer that same fate. Look, we do not belong to the nation of Canada. Bottom line is we serve under the king of kings, lord of lords, and our nation is spiritual Israel. Here... We will certainly suffer along with them as, as rules change and mandates change and laws change and, and God's p wrath comes upon this earth and he begins to try to, try to speak to people and to, to punish people and try to bring people to their knees in repentance. Certainly we will not be just completely free of being affected by this. right? Because God's going to go after Canada's storehouse. God's going to go after Canada's fields and the fruitfulness thereof. God's going to go after Canada's security. God's going to go after everything that he had blessed them with previous. He will turn it upside down and curse them in those same areas. And we have been rich. We have had much. And we have had plenty enough here in Canada. And God will bring those things to naught. And certainly the believers will be affected by it. Right? But we don't have to fall into the same trap and end up in complete destruction in the end. Where even if we're sold for slavery, people would refuse us. If we would, in our own hearts, and in our own congregation, and in our own families, in our own lives, mind, soul, body, all of our strength, give it unto God and serving Him and His commands, God can still carry a multitude through it. Look, we can be in Canada as it's suffering plagues, as it's suffering um, torments as a result of the destruction of God coming upon them, as in Egypt. We could be here in Canada as they experience all the plagues of Egypt and God can hold us safe in a Goshen. He can do that today. We can be thrown into a fiery furnace whereby the world that tried to destroy us is consumed in it and we can be there protected with Christ. God isn't, hasn't stopped working miracles in this way, but we need to start by observing to do the words of the law, all things that are written in this book, and fearing his glorious and fearful and wonderful name, the Lord thy God. He's your God. The Lord's your God. That's whom ye shall serve. And if we do, then all of this, and it's just example after example after example, verse after verse of things you're just like, I do not want to experience that. That's awful. That's terrible. That's horrific to even read. It doesn't have to be that way for us. If we serve God and obey God, the authority that he has put us under in truth. I thank you, Lord, for your...